Hi, this is Jamie Gale coming to you from Dale's Drum Shop. I'm going to talk to you today about, um, about cymbals. There's a lot of confusion in the cymbal world these days. There's so many brands out there, it's, it's hard to get your head around exactly what's happening. And so the guys at Dale's here asked me to sort of break it down as to a simple way to understand it. Um, there's currently about 30 different brands of cymbals the last time I counted in the cymbal world, but really there are four cymbals. And the way I say it, or the reason I say this actually, is because there are four ways the cymbals are made, and they yield distinctly different results. Uh, you'll see here I have four sort of you know popular brands here beside me um, because they represent the four different ways it is. Uh, the most popular of the methods, the one that we all think of when we think of a cymbal, is the Turkish method. Um, you know, the Turkish method is used by many companies in the marketplace. Uh, to name a few would be uh, Zildjian, Sabian, Bosphorus, Crescent, Istanbul, Turkish, Agap, Emet. <laughs> you know, and the list goes on and on. And all of those brands make a symbol in the Turkish style. And what that is, which you may have seen at some point in time on a, a factory tour, uh, is we, we take a bronze, an 80-20 bronze mix. So we have 80% copper, 20% tin, and we melt it down and we form uh, an ingot. It looks kind of like a big hockey puck, you know, it's kind of, kind of thick and about this large. And um, that sort of gets, gets cooled and put on a shelf, and when we're ready to make a symbol, we lay it down and we roll it out this way and that way, kind of like a, a pizza dough would be, I guess. Uh, and that metal becomes sort of one thickness and comes out in a bit of an oblong shape. It doesn't come out as a perfect circle. Um, so we have to then cut a circle out of it, and then we heat up that center and press the bell into shape. Then we lathe it, we hammer it. And that gets us the, the Turkish symbol and that sound that we're all sort of used to. Um, the second method, uh, I'm going to call the Swiss method, just because the, uh, the Swiss were the ones who made it most famous, although it didn't or originate there. I'm talking about um, the sheet symbol. Uh, the Pisces 2002, a very famous symbol uh, from a great symbol company in the world, has a very distinctive sound to it because it's not made in the Turkish method. It's made in a distinctly different way. This idea of rolling something out and coming out a different shape every time, um, this inconsistency is not really okay with the Swiss culture. They like consistency. You know, they like things to be predictable. That's why we pay them for their banks and their watches, you know, because they want to know what the result is. And frankly, if you break a sheet symbol, um, you can very confidently buy another one and expect it to show up at your home but exactly the same. They sound the same, the most consistent of all of them. Okay? So the way the Swiss make the symbol, the sheet symbol, is we have a large roll of metal that comes out and we have to cut circles out of it. Or at least they did at one point. These days I think they actually get a pre-cut for them. But the idea is it's one thickness, one consistency the whole way through. Um, the original symbols were actually made from a B8 bronze, which is uh, going to be 8% uh, tin with 92% copper, as opposed to the 80-20 mix that you find in the Turkish symbols. Um, and so we have one consistent material to work with all the time. But from there, we still have to heat up the center, press the bell into shape, lathe it, hammer it, and that's how we get the, uh, the Swiss sound. And you'll note there's always a distinctly different sound in it. There's always a much higher shimmery sort of sound to it. The high note is, is way up high on it, and uh, they, they cut through in a different sort of way. If you think about the timing of this symbol and when it came through, it was really sort of in the late 60s, early 70s, when um, basically, music got real loud, but the technology wasn't there yet. We had guys on the stage, you know, Jim Marshall came out with this big amplifier, the Marshall stack, Ampe came out with the SVT, and the drummer's sitting in the middle with a set of Ludwigs and, <laughs> and some old Ks, you know, trying to figure out how he's going to possibly keep up. So you saw guys like John Bonham coming out with massive drums, tuned up really high, and big, bright, Pisces cymbals that cut through the mix. If you listen to uh, recordings from that period of time, the one thing you didn't hear very well were the vocals because the PA still wasn't keeping up with what was happening on the stage. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of high-end clarity and, and volume and cut from the, uh, from the Swiss and the sheet symbol. Um, the other method here uh, would be the Chinese method. We have a, a Wuhan here, whether it be Wuhan, Zing Sur, uh, Dream, or all sort of Chinese symbols. Um, we don't know as much about their manufacturing method. Um, but we do know that it is a, uh, it's a hammered uh, bronze, it's somewhat uh, inconsistent that way, but the sound is most important that we recognize. The sound is always somewhat, um, somewhat archaic in its nature. It seems to be a, a little bit more sort of going on there. Um, some people say trashy, you know. And when, you know, the Turkish uh, or the Swiss make a similar sound, something like the Chinese symbol, we call it a China symbol, because that's the sound that we're all thinking of, okay? Um, 
There are some great uh, sort of price advantages within the Chinese symbols. Um, when you're shopping through them, they do tend to be uh, the least consistent of all the symbol brands. The Swiss are the most, the Chinese are sort of the least, uh, but there definitely can be a lot of value uh, found there as well. And it's a distinctly separate tonal palette. The fourth method is unique to UFIP. Um, I can't really call it the Italian method because there have been a number of other Italian manufacturers that um, they still years you can do it this way. The one thing that UFIP does that's unique is, uh, is rotocasting. Um, they don't actually make a flat symbol and force press the bell into shape. Uh, the symbol is actually cast with the bell into shape right from the beginning. Um, and so that, that ends up with a very unique response to the symbol. Um, Every other symbol method in the world, when you hit the symbol, it produces um, different notes. Um, when you hit it lightly, you hear the high note, you lean in a little more, you hear something else. And sometimes when you get your ride going, the low note builds up and, and sometimes overwhelm the high note and you feel like you've lost your stick definition um, because there's multiple notes happening. Sometimes when you crash them, you'll even hear um, a wavering of notes and that's, that's basically more than one note competing at the same time. Um, that doesn't happen in a UFIP because it actually only produces one note, and that's because of the way they cast that bell. You get more of a linear response. You get more wash and less wash, but the symbol doesn't pitch shift on you in any way. Um, so that's a very unique aspect about the, uh, about the UFIP symbols. Um, so when you're choosing a symbol and you're thinking about, you know, it's just for your own enjoyment or you're playing live or recording, you need to think about these aspects. Each one of these four methods um, represents a unique tonal palette, and to choose one of them uh, actually limits your tonal palette. You know, I think it's it's all great to say, you know, I'm into this particular brand or this, or this other brand, but the reality is, doing so as an artist limits your tonal capabilities um, because the Chinese don't produce the sound of the Turks or Ufip or or the Swiss here. And, uh, and, and vice versa for all the other ones. They don't actually produce the same sounds for each other. Um, and in recent years, you've seen some of the companies, um, like, uh, like, like Paiste actually, will, uh, has made more of a Turkish style ride, but it still sounds distinctly Swiss. It still has a very high-end shimmer to it. The Paiste signature sound is there. It's theirs. And um, there have been sheet symbols made by you know, Turkish manufacturers and such also. And everyone has sort of their own take on it, but understanding the way those different symbols are made, that they will yield specific results is important when choosing the sounds you're looking for. Um, so if you need something that's a little more sort of archaic and sort of trashy in its sound, um, no one does that quite like the, uh, the Chinese do. As a matter of fact, the origin of this symbol came from um, looking for an archaic sound. They're actually trying to scare away demons at the time with their gongs and cymbals. That's sort of where that sound came from. Uh, the origin of the Turkish symbol um, actually came from uh, a military aspect, actually. They, during the Bronze Age, they were brandishing their shields to scare away the opposing uh, armies, and those sounds um, sort of developed over time. And I guess someone eventually realized that shield, hey, that shield sounds pretty good. Let's play some jazz, you know, and, <laughs> and it evolved into musical instrument. It's not a shield anymore, but that's where it came from, and you can sort of see the aspects of that. Um, on this side here, actually, Paiste, um, the, the the sheet symbol, and uh, and Ufip here with their symbol are the only two of the four methods that were evolved for a musical instrument. Um, uh, Paiste is actually the newest of the companies. Um, where they developed as a musical instrument manufacturer. Um, and UFIP uh, actually is a coming together of five families in Tuscany um, that were all musical instrument makers. And, uh, and the oldest of those, uh, the Tarangis, have been making um, church bells and organ pipes and such for 400 years. And the initial need for the cymbal came from composers actually in Italy who were looking for a cymbal sound on their organ. Because the organ at that point in time was kind of like our modern day synthesizer. You know, you had a a row for, for reeds, for brass, and hey, I want a drum and a cymbal. And now the organ maker has to figure out how to make a cymbal. And that's how that came about. So these two were actually made. Um, the origin was specifically for musical instrument. These guys had a little bit of a longer evolution to sort of get there. Um, so understanding those cymbal sounds are, are important. And uh, one of the great things about having a resource like Dale's Drum Shop is you have a bunch of guys here who really know their stuff and who have worked with each one of these symbols. Um, they, they spent time with them, they played them, and they really understand what makes this symbol different from this one and this one and this one here. So, so use that resource. It's very important to be able to call and talk to them about that. 
Um, and of course, each one of these companies has uh, has websites you can look into, and there's been books on symbols and uh, Drum Magazine did an issue, uh, symbol issue a few years ago that has some great information as well. So uh, thank you for uh, for your time today. We always appreciate you stopping by uh, the Dale's Drum Shop website.